So this is a story about cognitive mapping, the use of technology, and whether we're becoming a society of spatial idiots. And uh, you know, a lot of these spatial idiots are really making me mad these days. You can't ask them where to go, can't get directions from them, all these kinds of things. And so, you know, we're using GPS and other technologies that are, you know, helping take the load off our brain. But unfortunately, we may be uh, disusing, you know, not using our brain like we used to do and for some of the things that it was evolved to do. And so we might be damaging our brain, but we also might have an opportunity to hijack some of those uh, hardware cycles from various brain areas and use them for something else. And so this is kind of the thesis of this talk is, you know, uh, what are we doing to our brains by using all this technology? And, uh, you know, is there any opportunity there to, uh, to get some of that? So this is also a story about train driving rats and why somebody would train rats to drive little cars. And I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, people ask me what cognitive mapping is, and I guess the simplest way to say it is it's the GPS in your mind. So a cognitive map tells you how to get from point A to point B and where the valuables are all over the environment and uh, ha helps you with memory for where things are. And it's something that animals have done forever. And uh, of course, you know, you got to run away from the predators. You need to know where to go. So you need to keep a map of space in your mind. Well, there's an area of the brain called the hippocampus that seems to be the GPS in the brain. It's also a key memory area for episodic memory, the memory for events and where they happened. So inside the hippocampus, there are neurons that fire depending on where the animal is. Now I'm talking about mammals and in particular rats. So if you stick wires into the hippocampus of rats, you can start to hear the popping of neurons firing action potentials. That's called spikes in the business. So if the rat happens to be over here, some of the neurons will fire. If you can record a lot of these simultaneously, you can hear some of them turn on over here. And when the rat moves over here, different ones turn on. They fire pops, sounds like popcorn. They move over here, different ones fire. When you go back here, the same ones that used to fire here now fire. And so if you can record these neurons simultaneously for a while, then you can actually shut your eyes and you can just tell where the rat is uh, just on what neurons are firing. And so you can plot different trajectories the rat is doing uh, just by monitoring these neurons. And uh, so it's really quite fascinating. And what that did was uh, lead uh, some theorists back in the 70s to propose that the hippocampus is the cognitive map. It is the place where a map of your environment is stored. You build up the relationships between items, uh, things in that map, and you use that information strategically to get from A to B, to do shortcuts, to do these kinds of things that we like to do uh, in space. So other evidence was that rats without hippocampus uh, or hippocampi uh, aren't able to use space flexibly. Now this hippocampus is conserved across all mammalian species and so it appears that the hippocampus, it looks the same, uh, different sizes and things like that in different mammals, but it looks like humans and rats have the same type of activity going on in the hippocampus. Now it's much more difficult to get place cell, uh, place readings uh, from the human hippocampus, but the evidence seems to point that that's conserved. So here's a picture of um, some uh, neurons firing, just to drive that point home. Uh, the black area over here at the top of this triangular maze shows a neuron firing across that arm of the maze. Then the kind of uh, salmon color there um, is a different neuron. And we recorded all these simultaneously while the rat ran around this triangular maze. And then the green cell maps another area of space, the blue and the yellow. So that's five different neurons responding to where the animal is. Now, there's a couple of different types of spatial cognition that go on. There's egocentric, which is relative to yourself. So I put this uh, street sign right here on the corner to show that you can just go there 
and turn left and turn right and you can get around. You really don't need to have a cognitive map to get around the environment. And a lot of people navigate just that way and uh, I frequently do. It's not a very flexible way, so if that sign is gone, you're kind of trapped. Uh, so there's egocentric, and your body is, your brain is full of uh, egocentric coordinates. You know, there's parts of your brain that respond to the angle of your elbow and your wrist, and how things are related to your eye and retinocentric coordinates. They're all based on, you know, yourself. But the allocentric mapping is the mapping related to the outside environment. And that's your place inside that. So if you can think of a Cartesian coordinate and you have a place on there, and you build that map up. So now I guess we should get into the point of why train rats to drive cars. So what we wanted to know is how do these cells get updated information? I mean, the rat's moving. How does one neuron know to turn on and another know to turn off? And what drives that? So the leading guesses would have to be, you know, ambulation. If I'm a rat with four limbs, I walk. Um, the inner ear sensation. Um, and then optic flow. And optic flow is the movement of uh, patterns and textures by your uh, side of your eyes as you're moving through. So all of those things give you the sensation of movement. And a lot of people say, well, the inner ear, I understand that when your car feels like it's going backwards and other cars are, um, you know, when some car is pulling out or pulling in and things like that. So those are the three kind of main hypothesized um, motion signals that would update this system. So what we did was train these rats to drive cars. And what's that do? That takes the limb movements out. They're still moving in space. They're still going to the same places. They know the environment, but they're just getting there a different way. And then we used a uh, G-scale train track and, uh, you know, had the rats do it that way. But then later we became more sophisticated about this and built an apparatus that had a turntable and uh, curtains and everything mounted outside the environment. So sometimes we would rotate the world backwards uh, around the rat so when they pushed to drive the car. And so they actually never even went anywhere in, in space. They uh, stayed right in the same place. And I'll tell you that that seems to be what virtual reality is in our day and age. I mean, very rarely do we uh, move about in these virtual environments. And so driving the world spinning around you is probably uh, very close to virtual reality. So this is our question. How, how does this happen? And, you know, there's some clues. Um, you can put a rat in an environment and the place cells um, occupy normal places like we would think. You turn off the lights and the place cells are still kind of occupying the same area. So it's, it's a memory system and it doesn't require vision necessarily. Um, so we gave the, the rat the car and there's that picture again. There's the car. Um, so what do we see? These are the best place cells that we could record uh, from place fields we could record. So they're plotted twice, and that can be a little distracting, but we did that for a reason. But you can see during walk, th along the x-axis is the distance around the track, and going up the y-axis are the number of spikes fired by the neuron. So we can see that there's a very tight representation during walking, but in the same environment, we get a looser covering a wider space. Now we still get some place response. You know, it's quiet in some places and active in others, but we see that the response is diminished and it covers a much wider area of space. And then in the VR condition, what we call the rat VR condition, the world is spinning around and we get a very, very light bit of spatial firing on these neurons. So, you know, and there are uh, billions of these neurons in the hippocampus. Uh, if you can get there with the wires, you can get these kinds of responses. So we see that the world spinning and the car driving is an impoverished form of space. So these are individual uh, plots of the same type of phenomena. Uh, up at the top, it's, it's laps coming down the y-axis, and then it's uh, across the environment again, double plotted. So you can see that this neuron, the same neuron, was uh, quiet when the rat was driving, but in the middle here, it's walking, and it got very, very tight, and then it went back to spread out again. And so you see this pattern over and over. Uh, walk is usually the middle part that's really tightly um, sandwiched there. We also looked at the EEG. There's an 8 hertz. That's 8 times per second signal. 
um, when rats are driving or walking slowly, it looks just like they're driving. But when they're walking fast, we have this really attenuated hump on this waveform. But the car, uh, the wa uh, car driving really just stays the flat, just like the animal is going slowly in the environment. So there's this amplitude um, for walking, but there's no change in amplitude in this signal for driving. So, you know, and then we can get into a lot of, the, the essence of this is that we have a much less activity, it's much less specific, and it doesn't carry as much information about the environment um, as during dry, uh, driving or in world. So walking is the, uh, is really the strong condition. So we can go through all of that. Uh, we made mathematical models uh, of this, and uh, it all seems to check out pretty tightly. So, so what are the implications for learning in virtual environments? So first of all, we have bigger, fewer spikes, bigger place fields. Um, when the neurons fire, they don't fire at the peak of this EEG signal, and that's where neuroplasticity is maximum uh, in the hippocampus. And I should mention that the hippocampus is related to lots of different memory. It's not just space, but humans who lose their hippocampus lose the ability to learn new facts. And so a famous patient who lost his hippocampus had to re-meet his doctor um, every day. It's kind of like that movie 50 First Dates. Um, it's a type of amnesia. So he had intact older memories, but he couldn't make new memories. So there's this relationship between spatial location and memory that uh, the hippocampus seems to do. And uh, so what this data shows us is that that function is weakened when you're not walking to these places and learning your environment by walking. Um, so learning in virtual reality and computer games does not seem to be hippocampus uh, dependent. It seems like uh, we could take the hippocampus out and the rats would perform the same. Uh, and there is no space uh, coding there related to that, at least very weak. So you may need to walk around in order to get that. Now, getting back to the main point, we have this brain that's at least 10,000 years old, and many of the things that we're doing today didn't exist during the evolution of the brain, and even if uh, even the brain of 100,000 years ago or even a million years ago is pretty close to the same brain that we have today. So we've evolved um, all this technology that take off the load off our brains. So, you know, we're using Twitter. I suppose that might increase the load on our brains sometimes. But, you know, writing, reading, all of these things were not around when our brain evolved. And so what's happened is our brain has been able to, our society and technology has been able to hijack the brain in a way to do things that it was never designed to do. You know, operate a fax machine, if anybody still knows about faxes. So... So these kinds of things, you know, appear on the horizon all the time, and, and our brain seems to be able to pull them in, and it must use ancient structures designed for things like getting around to uh, do these modern things. And so I'll contend that sitting at your computer uh, or doing virtual reality or using your GPS is taking the load off this hippocampus, this spatial match, uh, mapping system. So... Um, what, we, what we're saying is that, uh, you know, it's either time to use it or lose it. I mean, we have to find ways, if we're not going to use this brain area, it's so important in memory and related to Alzheimer's disease and other uh, memory disorders, if we're not going to use it for what it was intend for, intended for, I think we need to find a new activity that is like spatial mapping that we might be able to tap into this ancient system and very powerful system as a way of... Uh, of uh, utilizing these uh, unused cycles in the brain, you know? And so I think that children, for example, uh, naturally will find ways to kind of do this. I think in some ways the, the brain is designed to seek out the types of tasks that it can do. So I think that, you know, you give children these computers and they're gonna start to organize things in spatial ways. That's something we ought to pay attention to. And uh, even for those of us who are a little older, there's no reason that we can't still go that direction. But I think we need to either throw away our GPSs or find another use for our hippocampus. Thank you. <laughs>